Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to be reading from Acts 1, verse 1 to 11, for those who want to follow along with me. Um, I just do need to say hi to Em and Sarah because they're my little ones and they're dialing in from home today. So <laughs> they, were, they asked me to specifically do that. <laughs> Sorry. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Thanks, Nikki. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Dialing in from home, particularly Nikki's kids and, and Dale, hello. Uh, that's good to be back. There's been a bunch of sickness going around. Hey, and m myself and me, me and the family copped it, so it's nice to be back preaching this morning. Last week we had Cara filling in, and about 12 hours later she came down with COVID. So beware being asked to preach, <laughs> because we'll see what happens. You might come down with a sickness, uh, but it's really awesome to be back. Hey, as Tony mentioned before, today we start a new series, which I'm really excited about. It is called I Will Build My Church. You can see it with the, the uh, placards, the boards behind me there. I will build my church. What are we talking about? Is this a quote from myself? Is it? No, it's not a quote from me talking about the local church here at Harborside. It's also not the start of a building campaign. We're not trying to raise funds for renovations. Although, I kind of like the idea though, so I'm going to keep it in the back of my mind for future projects. This is Jesus' words, quoted in Matthew chapter 18. Jesus very famously, you may know this, asks his disciples, who do you say I am? And then Peter replies very famously, you're the one. You're the Messiah. You're the King of Kings. You're the Lord of Lords. You are the one. And Jesus says, yes, you were right. And on this truth... I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. In this series, we're looking together at that story, the story of the beginning of the church, Jesus building his church. Now, in your Bibles, you will find the book of Acts as the fifth book of the New Testament after the four Gospels. And uh, you can think of it, really, as the history of the church, volume one, right? And let me tell you, there is so much in it for you and I, so much to witness, so much to learn. It's incredibly exciting. How did Jesus build his church? Now, excuse me, I'm just going to fiddle with this. There we go, that's a bit better. How did Jesus build his church? It's a great question for us to be thinking. Now, this particular message, right, we're introducing a new book. So before we jump in, we're going to be doing a little bit by way of introduction, okay? So a little more teaching up front. Are you with me? Yeah, okay, we can do this together. There's so much to learn, but before we just jump in, we're going to need to do a little bit by way of introduction, but that's okay. I know I'm not going to be doing it on my own. Let's do it together. It is a special and exciting book. Like the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's recording history for us, right? It's recording history. It's a narrative, a story, a true story about the early church. And it's a unique time in history. It's what theologians call salvation 
history. Like I've already said, how the church of Jesus Christ began. But even this, right, it's just a a snapshot. We don't know all the characters, all the places, all the churches, all the stories, all the miracles. It's just a selection. Now, in this book, we're going to see amazing miracles. We're going to see epic stories, wonderful adventures. And along the way, we're going to be, every now and then, going to have to ask a question. We're going to have to ask a question. When looking at a passage before us, we're going to have to ask this question. Is what we're reading descriptive or prescriptive? And what do I mean by that? What we're reading, is, is it just telling us what happened? Or is there more to the story here? Are we supposed to read what's going on and put into practice what's happening? Are future generations supposed to read what's going on here and put it into practice? That would be prescriptive. And let me tell you, it's not always super clear. Can I give you an example? Chapter 1, after Jesus' ascension, we'll we'll get there in a little bit, the disciples choose Judas' replacement, Matthias. And how do they do it? They do it by lot, which is a little bit like flipping a coin. Is that how we should choose leaders in the church? Flip a coin. Who should be a leader? You and me? Let's flip it. Let's see. They prayed beforehand, but should we do that? In chapters 2 and 4, we see the early Christians sharing their their possessions incredibly. It almost looks like there is no individual um, ownership. Should Christians today have no individual ownership? Should we all, you know, have kind of own things for the common good? Now, I think the answer to both those questions is no. But how do we get to that answer? Well, We've got to do a bit of context. We've got to look at the rest of the Bible and try and answer these questions by seeing what does the rest of the Bible teach. Yep, so we're going to keep that in mind. Is this just descriptive or is it prescriptive? That's going to be helpful as we go. Now, here's a question. Why study Acts? Why study this book? What will it profit you? What will it profit us today, living in 2022 in in Mossman, in modern-day Sydney, What's it going to do for us? Why do it? The answer is, you and I will be encouraged. Why? Well, we can easily answer it's God's word, and all of it is useful for teaching and learning and and rebuking and encouraging us, training, right, all of it, okay? But why specifically Acts? Can I give you a couple reasons? Here's the first one. You and I, we're going to be reminded and encouraged that God is in control. God is in control. Major theme of the book of Acts is God's sovereignty. That just means he's in control. This week, um, I gathered with a bunch of other pastors who had started churches, church planters, and uh, we take it in turns to to meet up and to host each other and uh, hang out together, eat some food, and someone shares from the Bible, and, and someone shares their story. You know, what... Tell us your story of planting the church. And it was my turn this week to host, so I had this group at our church here, and I got to share the story of Harborside. And I I loved doing it, mostly because I like talking. And uh, I I really enjoyed it. But I tell you what, it was just, as I did, as I shared the story, I was reminded again and again of God's goodness. I was reminded again and again of the fact that He is in control. We've always said this church, the the rebirthing of a church here, has always been God's idea. We've just been along for the journey, right? It's always been his idea. He's been orchestrating, putting everything together. He is in control. And as I shared the story, I was just reminded again and again. Now, two weeks ago, before I shared, did I know that God was in control? Did I know the truth that God is sovereign? Of course I did. But as I shared, I tell you what, just... My knowledge of that fact and my experience of God's sovereignty, the fact that he's in control, just went deeper and deeper. Now, you, you and I can do this simply when we look back on our lives through the eyes of faith. We don't always know why things happen, but I tell you what, as we look back on our lives, we can so often see God working together good. You know what I mean? Expect that more and more. As we look at this book, as we look at the book of Acts, throughout the book, you know, so often you're reading it and something happens, you go, oh man, this looks like bad news for the church. How could God possibly use this for, oh. 
But throughout the book, again and again, we see God accomplish his plans despite humans' best efforts otherwise. And in the process, he uses broken people like you and me to accomplish his plans. Okay, why else is it good to study the book of Acts? Another reason, we see how the early church struggled, how they dealt with issues. It's easy to to romanticize the early church, particularly in a few weeks, we'll look at that beautiful passage in chapter two where the the early church gathered together and it's, oh, it's easy to romanticize them. Well, if you feel like that, go ahead and read 1 Corinthians and you'll see all the struggles, all the issues that the early church had. And in the book of Acts, we see how they dealt with issues. Issues like, how do they deal with persecution? How do they deal with division in the church? Because they experienced it. How do they deal with integrating different nations and different cultures? How how, how do we decide what roles there should be in the church and who should play them? What does it mean to be a faithful follower of Jesus? And we're going to see many more than that as well. I tell you what, when it comes to our struggles, don't you reckon in our struggles we can often think, oh, we're the only ones. No one else has had to deal with this, don't you think? Uh, you know, no one else has had to deal with struggles like this before. And when we do that, we get discouraged and isolated. But it's not true. God's people have always found it difficult to follow him faithfully. What can we learn from the early church in that way? Tell you what, we're also going to be encouraged that God moved. Right? God moved, and hear this, is still moving. God moved in powerful ways, and he is still moving moving today, because here's a cool thing, the book of Acts doesn't end. Think about it, the book of Acts doesn't end. I found this quote, which I loved, it was, this was written in the late 1800s, still very true. Church of Christ, that's you and I, church. The records of these Acts of the Holy Ghost, that is the book that we're about to dive into, have never reached completeness. This is the one book which has no proper close because it waits for new chapters to be added so fast and so far as the people of God shall reinstate the blessed spirit in his holy seat of control. I love that. God isn't done with building his church. He's not done with building his church. He is still moving. He is still building his church. Don't you love that? The book of Acts has not ended. We're just looking at volume one. It's encouraging. Okay, just one more thing by way of introduction. And for this, we're going to dive into the first verse of our reading, read so well for us by Nikki before. Let's just have a quick look here. In my former book, Theophilus, we'll get to who he is in a little bit, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Hang on a second. Who's talking here? Who's the I? Okay, so here's the question. Who wrote this book? Who wrote the book of Acts? The answer is a guy called Luke. His former book is the Gospel of Luke. The same person who wrote the Gospel of Luke, same person who wrote Acts. And we can see here in the book he wrote all about, in in his first book, the Gospel of Luke, he wrote all about what Jesus began to do and teach. And the implication is, his next book, Acts, he continues to write all about what Jesus taught what he did and what he taught. First book, the Gospel of Luke, he focuses on Jesus' earthly ministry. Second book, Acts, he focuses on Jesus' ministry from heaven. Same guy, same actions, same focus, really, right? Now, the the people even, Luke and Acts are so linked, people talk about Luke-Acts, right? They're so linked. So much so that it's actually helpful to go back to the first couple of verses of the Gospel of Luke to answer the question why he wrote them. Why did he write the book of Acts? Why did he write the book of Luke? Why did he write the book of Acts? That's going to help us. Let's have a look. Just really quickly, we're going to tease out a couple things here. So we're going all the way back to his first book, Gospel of Luke. Let's have a look together. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, 
I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most ex excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of things you have been taught. I just spend a minute unpacking a couple of things here. First thing, we can see Luke is recording historical events. When he talks about the things fulfilled among us, what's he talking about? Jesus' birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, giving of the gift of the Holy Spirit, um, commissioning the apostles, right? These are historical things. He's talking about historical things. What else? He is telling us, he's writing the testimony of eyewitnesses. Luke didn't make this up, right? He is recording what people who were there saw. This is the content of Luke and of Acts. What else? Luke tells us he carefully investigated. He's an, a, a master historian, this guy. Carefully investigated, did his own personal research, interviewed people, and then he wrote it down. He wrote an account. And here's the kicker. Why did he do it? Why did he do it here? So that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Now, this Theophilus character, put simply, we don't really know who he is. He could be some Roman official. We don't quite know. But I tell you what, it doesn't really matter. Because why did he write it? Why did he write Luke Acts, these two books? To give assurance to God's people. It's you and I, right? To give assurance to us so that we can have confidence in the things we've been taught. Now, you can imagine People hearing back in, back in those days, hearing these things about Jesus, why have these books been written so they can have assurance of what they've been taught. Oh, I heard Jesus like claimed he could forgive sins. Yes. I heard Jesus claimed the reason he came to earth wasn't to judge everyone, but, but, but to save people. Yes. I heard Jesus rose from the dead. Yes. I heard Jesus poured out his, his spirit on people that would receive him. Yes. Luke wrote both books for God's people. That's us. To have assurance of who Jesus is, what he's done, and what he's still doing. Now, what should this book be called? I don't know if you're aware, there's, there's been a, lots of different, well, a handful of different interpretations of what this book acts should be called. Our earliest uh, manuscript that what we have of, of Acts has simply got the Greek word praxis on it, just Acts. So throughout church history, it's been known as Acts or the Acts. For a long, long period of church history, it was known as the Acts of the Apostles, also known as Acts of the Holy Spirit. It's also been known as the Acts of the Risen Lord Jesus. I had um, a lecturer at college who loved to call it that so much, so he wrote a book all about that. The Acts of the Risen Lord Jesus. I found a really long version this week as I was researching this. Sorry, this thing's annoying me. Uh, it said this, the continuing words and deeds of Jesus by his spirit through his apostles. So that's a mouthful. We're not going to be referring to it like that. Now, what should we call it? What do you think? I tell you what, you decide as we journey through this book. We'll just call it Acts for the moment, but it could be any number of those things. Okay, we needed to do a little bit of intro work before we dived in. I hope that's all right. Now we're going to jump in. What's our focus for this morning? Here's the question I want to look at together. It's this. How did Jesus start building his church? Right? What's the series? I will build my church. This is the story. How did he do it? How did Jesus start building his church? The answer is this. With purpose and with power, with purpose and with power. Let's jump in together. We're going to look uh, closely at really the first handful of verses to answer this question. How did Jesus start building his church with purpose and with power? Have a look. We already looked at this verse here, didn't we? In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. What do we see here? Jesus was taken up into heaven. It's what we call the ascension, right? Pretty important time in salvation history, an unrepeatable event, a big, unique moment. We don't want to skip over it. You heard in the reading from Nikki, verse 9, we get more info. After he'd said this, Jesus was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him 
from their sight. Now, here's a question. Why did Jesus leave? Have you wondered that question before? Why did he go? Why did Jesus leave? Have you ever wondered that? Why didn't he stick around? Why didn't he stick around even just a little bit longer? Why did he even leave at all? Jesus says he comes back from the dead, which is a pretty rare thing to do, a pretty amazing thing. He comes back from the dead. He says, I'm going to change everything. I've got a plan to save the world. Apostles, you're going to lead it. You're going to be my witnesses, and I'm off. (laughs) Right? I mean, I, I, I would have thought a founder leaving so soon in order to start a movement is kind of odd. Wouldn't you want to stick around for a little while and establish things? Why did he go? Jesus plainly told his disciples why. He said to them, it's going to be better for you if I go. Why? Because I'm sending someone else. I'm sending the gift of the Holy Spirit, which will be better for you. Really better? All right, stay with me for a moment. This is a little weird, right? It's a little weird to think But if Jesus didn't leave, he would have been limited to one geographical place at a time. Now, it's odd to think about limiting Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, the Son of God. I want to be careful in doing that, but I think I'm right. In sending the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, Jesus is able to be with all people who receive him always anywhere. Right? Jesus says... I will be with you always until the very end of the age. How does he make good on that promise? By sending the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's a bit mind-blowing to think about that, but it's true. I don't know about you, but um, I often... (laughs) I often get lost at malls, right? Which I like to call the happiest places on earth. Not really, I really struggle to, my wife's laughing because I've got this 35 to 40 minute window at malls before I just crack it and sort of have a tantrum. I'm not very good at being there. Something about it, I'm overwhelmed. Men, can I get an amen? Anybody else getting some <laughs> warrants? Yes, yeah. It's just, how long's your time limit? You got about, you're not long? 40 minutes, half an hour, yes. It's tactical, yeah. There's something about it, I just, I can't stand being there for very long. Uh, I just really, I'm sorry about that, but I don't. Now, when I'm there with Pip, she knows her way around really well, so I'm fine. I just follow her around. But when I'm there by myself, which is pretty rare, I look for those boards. You know what I'm talking about? Those boards with the map, and they have that beautiful thing, you are here. Because that's what I'm looking for. I'm not very good with maps. I'm not very good, particularly in car parks. I just can't find my way out for some reason. I'm not very good with directions. So I'm looking for you are here. Why? Because it orients you, doesn't it? You're like, okay, I'm on the third floor. I'm next to that awful shop that smells like perfume. It's overwhelming my senses. I can't even think, but that's where I am. You know what I mean? You are, excuse me, you are here. Now, I've heard lots of times from skeptics, even from Christians, man, I want to see Jesus. You heard that? If only I could see Jesus. I, I want to be like Thomas. You remember doubting Thomas, the disciple? Now, I'm not going to believe unless I see. Jesus shows up in front of him. Thomas, here I am. Touch my hands. Touch my side. I want to be like Thomas. Why can't I? I want to see Jesus. Well, why can't I? Here's the answer. Pretty simple. If you'd been alive then, you could have. If you'd been alive then, in that particular time and place, you could have. But I'm sorry, you're not. You are here. Okay? It might not be a very satisfying answer, but it's the truth. You and I, we live in a particular time and place in God's great rescue plan. You are here. Where are we? After Jesus' death, resurrection, ascension, sending of his gift of the Holy Spirit, and before he comes back. You and I live here. Might be hard for some of us to believe, but I think it's a pretty good time. I'd say it's even better. Why? Because we have the gift of his word. 
the completed word of God. And because we have the gift of his indwelling spirit. Friends, these are not second class gifts. I want to see Jesus. Oh, man. We have two incredible gifts, not to mention the gift of his people. Incredible gifts. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about that wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit in a moment, particularly next week as we look at Pentecost. Now, we can't go any further without answering a pretty important question. Who are these apostles that get talked about? Because they feature pretty heavily in the book of Acts. Who are they? Quite important in the history of the church. Can we just spend a moment or two looking at that? Really important. All right. Well, the word apostle just means Greek. The New Testament writers didn't come up with this word, apostolos. It was around before the New Testament was written. And it basically just means sent one, delegate, right? An ambassador carrying the authority of the sender, which makes sense, doesn't it? Luke mentions them in verse 2. Now, who are they? Who are these apostles? They are simply the 11 disciples that Jesus gathered. Judas is no longer with them, of course. They replace him with Matthias in a little while. But this is who they talk about. Who are the apostles? They're the disciples that Jesus gathered in this earthly ministry. Same people. Now, you might hear of people today claiming to be apostles. And when we hear that, I think we should be pretty wary uh, people can use the word loosely these days, maybe to mean someone who builds, someone who pioneers things. And, you know, in a spirit of generosity, I go, yeah, okay, fair enough. But generally speaking, the apostles had a unique role in a unique time in history. Now, does that really matter? It does. Why? What did it mean to be apostle? Uh, sorry, what did it mean to be an apostle? Very specific requirements. Can we just spend a minute or two having a look at that? It's really important before we dive in to this book here. Let's have a look. Verse 2, Jesus, it says that Jesus chose these people, right? He chose these apostles. All the apostles, even Matthias and Paul, weren't self-appointed. I mean, they didn't appoint themselves. Other humans didn't appoint them. Okay, a committee, a church didn't appoint them. They were directly and personally chosen and appointed by Jesus Christ himself. Now, does this really matter? It really matters. Because these apostles were responsible for establishing the church and its teaching. What else? Jesus showed himself to these people, and he taught them. Verse 3. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. The foundation witnesses had to be eyewitnesses to Jesus' ministry, particularly the resurrection of Jesus. And he gave them many convincing proofs. I love that that is recorded for us. Jesus had to give them many convincing proofs. I love that. They had to be convinced. Can you blame them? Someone rising from the dead doesn't happen very often. What did Jesus have to do? Jesus, do that fish-eating thing again, because are you a ghost? I mean, Jesus, can I touch you just one more time? Sure, sure. You know, what was it like? Jesus, tell me, how does it work again? How, how does the cross fit together? How did you defeat death? What else did he have to do to convince these people? Well, he did it over a period of 40 days. What else did he have to do? I love that. I don't blame them. If these people, these men are going to be preaching and teaching all about this Jesus, I tell you what, they better be convinced he is the risen son of God. Jesus spent 40 days with them doing just that, teaching them all about one subject. We're told the kingdom of God, what it is and what it now looks like. And what else? What else does it mean to be an apostle? Jesus commissioned them for their task. Have a look. This is verse 8. We'll look at the first half in just a second. Jesus said to these apostles, you will be my witnesses. That word kind of means signpost. You'll point people to me. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He commissioned them. You guys have a job, a task. What was the question we were looking at this morning? How did Jesus Start building his church. Here's, here's the answer. One of the answers with a clear purpose. 
you will be my witnesses to continue his work of establishing the kingdom of God on earth. You think about this for a moment, right? Jesus began the greatest movement the world has ever seen. He never built a building, did he? He never wrote anything down. How did he do it? He gathered together a bunch of people, a small group of people, and gave them a clear purpose. What else? And he gave them power. Look at this with me. He gave them power. Jesus promised them, his witnesses, the power of the Holy Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. A few verses before this, Jesus says, wait, wait for this gift of my Father. Wait for this gift of the Holy Spirit because I've commissioned you with a task to be my witnesses. It's not going to be easy and don't attempt to do it in your own strength. You won't be able to. You won't be able to. Okay, it's clear, isn't it? That Jesus gave the apostles a clear purpose and it's also clear he equipped them with the power of the Holy Spirit to do it, purpose and power. Whom God calls, he also equips. Now, before we close for this morning, let's bring it to today, to you and I, as we close. Let me say this. You and I are given the same purpose. Different context, yeah? Different context, for sure, but the same exciting purpose. You will be my witnesses. Throughout this book, we are going to be asking ourselves, what does that mean? What does it mean to be Christ's witnesses today? I mean, what does it mean to be his witnesses as the gathered local church? I love asking that question. How do we embody incarnate Christ in this area now, together as his people, as this local church? What does that look like? What does it look like for you to be a local, a, a, a member of this local church? But I tell you what, what does it look like to be Christ's witness in every sphere of our lives? In home, at, at school, at uni, at work, in our friendships, what does it mean to have the same purpose? That's what we have as the church, as the people of God, the same purpose. You will be my witnesses. That just means a sign post to Jesus, pointing to him. What does it mean to be his witnesses? And guess what? You're not alone in that task. Because that can be a scary task. That can be a difficult task. You're not alone. We are not alone. Jesus said, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. How? Through the Holy Spirit, through the gift of the Holy Spirit. We'll look at this in much more detail next week as we look at Pentecost. But you and I, all those who would receive Christ, have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit to empower us for the purpose he's given us. Whom God calls, he also equips. We've got a clear purpose. We're empowered to do it. Now, God is not in the business of giving someone a great purpose, a great task, and then saying all the best with that. He gives us the power to do it in. Now, hang on, let me just say, though, that doesn't mean that we won't feel weak at times. That doesn't mean we also won't feel like we can't do it. We may, may, may feel ill-equipped. Have you ever been given a task and thought, how on earth am I going to do this? Yeah, I sure have. But I tell you what, for the people of faith, for people who trust in our great God, we are to trust that he will empower us for the purpose he's given us. And do you know where it starts? It starts with prayer. It starts with prayer. There's this funny little scene in verse 9 when Jesus ascends into heaven and the disciples are just sort of, I mean, they're standing there just looking. And we don't know how long they were looking for. It could have been five minutes. It could have been a couple of hours. We're not sure. And we're told the angels appear couple of angels and so, I don't know I can imagine sort of just digging them in the ribs and go hey guys yeah 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 he's gone he will come back one day but right now remember kind of the task that you were given now they were strictly commanded wait for the gift but you know what they did 
They went and they prayed. They prayed for the gift. Lord, we know that you've promised us this, but they went and in a beautiful sh- a showing of unity, they prayed together. They gathered in an upper room and they prayed. And I tell you what, we've got something to learn from that. The first thing we need to do, pray. So that's what we're going to do right now as we close. We're going to pray that God would embolden us as we ask this question together, how do we be his witnesses? I'm excited for this series as we continue to ask that question. As we see how does being Christ's witness in every sphere of our life takes shape. As we see how the early church was birthed, as we learn from them, asking similar questions today of how to be a faithful follower of Jesus. But right now, we're going to pray. So could we do that together, church? Let's be still, let's be quiet, and let's pray. Our Lord, Heavenly Father, thanks for your word. Thank you for the book of Acts. Thank you for recording for us a a special and exciting time in history. Lord God, we want to be witnesses for you. We understand that you've given us a clear purpose in this life to be a signpost to you. But Lord, what does that look like? How do you want us to do that faithfully? We ask, Lord, that you would fill us afresh with your spirit. Lord, empower us. Give us a fire to live out our purpose. Lord, what can it look like to be your witnesses in our lives? Not anybody else's life, but the life you've given us. God, we pray that this week and throughout this series, you'd speak to us as we ask this question. Give us imagination. Give us creativity. Give us open hearts to hear from each other and from you about what it means to be your signpost here in Mossman. In Jesus' powerful name we pray together as your people. Amen.